Coming up on this week's show, the Tetris movie is almost here. A classic puzzle adventure gets re-released. We get the story of the classic Shadowgate with Dave Marsh. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our wonderful friends at Bitmap Books. Now, one of their books that comes highly recommended is Metal Slug, The Ultimate History. Now, this is a comprehensive guide to the popular shoot-em-up franchise with unrivaled access to SNK's archives, designers, and developers. You can get that and the rest of their retro gaming collection. Have a look right now at bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 364, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to the podcast that each and every week takes you on a nostalgic trip back to the golden age of video games, brings you up to speed on all the happenings in the world of retro from over the last week, and gives you exclusive access to some of the biggest names in the industry. And what a guest we've got for you this week. We'll tell you more about that in just a minute. And uh, Joe the Man Fox being a Reveling this weekend at a stag do in Budapest. Are you feeling all right, Joe? You're going to be energetic. This <coughs> I am. Um, I'm really rough. I keep muting myself to cough. <laughs> I can. T- I can hear it in your voice, Joe. Yeah, yeah. I've actually been back two days. But you know, you know, <laughs> it was that, you know, it was that hard. <laughs> yeah, for those outside the UK, stag do a bachelor party, essentially, isn't it? You're at, at yes, over the weekend. Yeah. Quick nice. question though: you're, you're in Budapest. Did you do any retro game shopping while you're out there? Oh, you know what? So the uh, we had an Airbnb. There was like 18 of us, so we we got this massive like hostel, essentially all to ourselves, and um, we were right next to the building. Next to us was a game shop, and I was like, what the hell? I looked through the window and it was all modern stuff. And then um, Uh. on the Sunday, that was like the civilized day, if you will. And we went and like, just like went and sat in a calf and had like a, you know, we weren't like slamming drinks that day. And I had a little Google and um, there was actually three retro game shops in the uh, area. And they were all like within a 15, 20 minute walk from the town center, but they were all closed on the Sunday. So I missed out, unfortunately. I mean, Google said they were retro game shops, whether they were or not. Um, it's, it's, it's probably safe that you didn't go on the drinking game uh, day to the retro game. Yeah. Clubs. You know, that, yeah. that, that could have ended badly. <laughs> that could have ended really badly. <laughs> I was going to say, though, because on my bachelor party that we had in Leeds a few years ago, we actually did end up going retro gaming shopping the day after, didn't you we? You were we walking around with, I think it was Plumbers Don't Wear Ties, and there were a few <laughs> other weird CDI games that you got. So, yeah. yeah I got a stack of CDI games that day, so it yeah. was actually uh, quite quite fruitful, that little visit to Leeds. So, uh, glad you're feeling slightly better, though, Joe. Get on the, uh, the Alka-Seltzer and the, uh, <laughs> the ibuprofen, you'll be all right. Uh, but we have got an amazing guest to... Uh, Talk to this week on the podcast. Now, this is something that we covered a couple of weeks ago, that Shadowgate is getting a, an official sequel now. Shadowgate, back in the day, very popular adventure game. Um, part of the, uh, it was called the MacVenture series originally from uh, Icom Games back in the early to mid 80s. And then I think really um, Shadowgate, from what I've seen, even though it wasn't a game I was too familiar with as a kid, I do know it was a, a popular title on the NES as well, which was quite rare for a kind of point-and-click adventure game to get ported successfully to a console. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it's not usually the route that these ones go, is it? They usually mm. stay on a home computer system, but to get that console port is 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 quite interesting. And then you've also got, uh, you know, Icom ended up getting taken over uh, by Viacom, who were the, uh, you know, owners of MTV and Nickelodeon as well. So you had a lot of that kind of... MTV franchises, stuff like Beavis and Butthead, and then also uh, that Rocco's Modern Life as well, uh, which is when Nickelodeon was just getting cool, I remember. Stuff like uh, Johnny Bravo and the uh, Powerpuff Girls. There was uh, all these cool franchises coming out. Yeah, and Icom, I mean, kind of going back to their their earlier games on the Mac, I mean, they were quite innovative as well, because obviously the Mac was a, a GUI system from day one. You know, you had the icons, menus, pointers. Yeah. Um, and before that, most text games were really, text adventure games were typing, weren't they? Um, and then they came along. Obviously, we had Sierra and LucasArts that did it a bit later. But it was very innovative, the fact that they used the Max window system to yeah. make an adventure game around rather than just having it all typing. And it's kind of like they, they went from Apple II 
into Macintosh as well and, and the changes that happen with those two different systems. Now, I did play the original Shadowgate last week before we did this interview because, I mean, it's had a, a load of updates over the years. It's come up many different platforms. Well, I downloaded an emulator and played it on the original Mac. Uh, I've got to say, I found it very difficult to play. It's, it's, <laughs> it's notoriously <laughs> tough, Dan. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. I thought, God, am I just awful at this game? But actually, no, it is brutal. A lot of those games back then were. I mean, you make a little mistake, it could cost you your life. But really, we're here from uh, this week's guest, which is Dave Marsh, who was actually behind the original Shadowgate and um, worked for Icon back in the day. Kind of some of the design decisions that you had around that original Shadowgate game and what it was like working for Icon and then going into their kind of CD-ROM era as well, because around the early 90s, they got into making some of those early FMV games like Dracula Unleashed and the uh, Sherlock's Home, Sherlock Holmes games that came out on platforms like the the CDI and the Commodore CD TV, and then like you mentioned, kind of going into that Viacom era when he was working on Super Nintendo games like Roadrunner and Daffy Duck. So <laughs> yeah, quite a varied decade he had at Icom and then going into Viacom. But it's very timely as well because um, finally there is going to be an official sequel to Shadowgate called Beyond Shadowgate that launches on Kickstarter next weekend. So we thought we'd chat to Dave about the history of Shadowgate and Icom and also hear all about bringing the franchise back for a new generation as well. So um, I found this one really interesting and I'm sure you will as well. Dave Marsh, our special guest, he'll be on the show in around half an hour from now. Now, before we do that, obviously first half of the podcast, we like to bring you up to speed on what's been happening in the world of retro over the last week. And uh, this was something that I remember us talking about, must have been two or three years ago now, that they were making a Tetris movie. And I think it's fair to say, we were all a bit sceptical at first. I we? thought they would go the route of kids' movies, so it'd be like, I'm the square block, and I'm, <laughs> I've got an <laughs> like identity crisis film. or something, you know. Yeah. I, I thought it would go like down the route of like space battle. Like it's like... Um, you know, it's like a galactic battle and the shapes of spaceships or something like that. Um, I actually completely forgot that this was being made slash coming out, but I do remember as being sceptical, like you said, Dan, but it's actually gone really quiet for quite some time. And reading this article, they actually filmed it and finished making it in 2021. So, I mean, either they've just been sitting on it for the right time or it's a truly terrible movie. Um, But but, but back to our point is it's actually a story of, it's a biopic, isn't it? It's a story of how Tetris got made and and how Nintendo got a hold of it and stuff like that. You know, I forget his name, but the Russian guy. Alex, I I can never say it, Pritchov, Alex. And yeah. um, Pajitnov, Pajitnov. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating story. I'm so glad that they've gone this route because it's... Te- Tetris was made when it was made. It was made in under the Soviet Union, mm. and um, it's made. You know, he was a Soviet engineer, and it was made for this system, which was a, a Soviet computer called the Electronic Nika sixty, and um, all the property that was made under the Soviet Union, obviously under communism, it was it, it it wasn't like yours. You didn't have ownership on it. You couldn't get any royalties. It became property of the Soviet Union. So that ended up getting sold on. But at that time, you know, you've got the Cold War going on and uh, you've got um, money probably coming from the sale of Tetris going into, you know, outdoing each other with missiles or or the the space race. (laughs) And uh, that whole kind of, you know, uh, communism, uh, Soviet Union versus the West, um, I think would play really well into a movie. And also about the rights of it as well, because he never actually owned the rights or got royalties and then eventually went over to America when he was invited. And then he got a reacquisition of the rights and, um, you know, eventually managed to get royalties from the games. But there was a period that he had one of the most popular games in the world. Everyone was playing it and he wasn't seeing a penny. Yeah. Mm. And it it is an interesting story about the rights of it as well, because I know there was different rights on home computers. Yeah. I remember yeah. like Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte, they had like rights to do it on certain machines. And then obviously Nintendo, you know, that was basically the, you know, the seller of the Game Boy really, wasn't it? You know, the Game Boy wouldn't have been anywhere near as successful as it was if Tetris hadn't been bundled with it. And I've got a feeling, I can't remember how many copies it sold. I'm trying to find it here on uh, on Google, but I can't find any information. I've got a feeling I heard once it was like, 
two hundred million or something. Uh, two hundred and two million copies. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, definitely got to be up there in like the most popular video games of all time. And this movie's coming to Apple TV. Mm in uh, March. So next month it's going to land on Apple TV. But yeah, basically what it is, except I mean, in my mind when we heard about the Tetris movie, I was picturing something like Tron. Yeah. yeah I, I, like I don't know why. I, I just have this association <laughs> with my head where it's like, you know, the movie's going to be a kid's movie or something like that, where this looks like it's more than a kind of Holt and Catch oh, Fire. They've, they've, um, yeah. they've already announced style. it's going to be rated an R because of like, because of language and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, it's yeah. definitely an adult. The film. whole, the whole war stuff they can, add into there but also like you know it originally came from this like little puzzle game mm. that they had mm. uh tetramines and uh minos tetraminos that's it and uh that kind of puzzle game influenced it so it's going to be that kind of story of creation and uh, this film looks exactly like the kind of one that i want to see <laughs> you know if if they're going to do it yeah it just looks like the, the aesthetic of it from what i've seen in the in the screenshots as well that looks really good, I think. And it kind of reminds me, I don't know if you guys saw, there was um, an Australian kind of made-for-TV movie that came out a few years ago about Julian Assange. No. Yeah. Um, the WikiLeaks founder. It looks kind of very similar to that in, in terms of look. You know, I think um, I think it's good for a new audience because a lot of kids these days are not going to know about growing up in a society where you have like a government computer, all the properties owned by the government as well and kind of you know people are used to us all having the same systems or all having apple or 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 windows you know and and just seeing this kind of different world it it will be something so alien to a new audience but um they'll be able to connect with it especially with stuff like competitive tetris and how big tetris is nowadays Mm. it will be good for people to see the roots of it Although, uh, like Joe mentioned, it is R-rated, so uh, yeah, don't show it to the kids until they're, what, 17? So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that lands on Apple TV next month. Looking forward to that. Now, something else that's um, landing very soon, uh, and this is actually comes out, um, well, yesterday when the show comes out, tomorrow, at the time we're recording this, and this is a new mobile version of the classic Mist that landed this week for iOS. And I've got to say, I think this looks incredible. Yeah, so this is a, a reimagining of the classic first person adventure mist um so this was a i think it was a an updated release of it in 2021 um i've played it on the oculus rift in vr and it looks very similar to this yeah so i'm not sure whether it's the same so kind it's of the same so it is the same version so it's the re-released version in 2021 is coming out on ios this week so yesterday uh, um the point of release um i've never played the mist games but this might be finally like my my chance to play it I say chance to play it. I've got it on Sega Saturn, but I've just never sat down with it to play it. <laughs> but maybe on the move on my iPhone, you know, this this could be the way to kind of get me into this game because I know it is a classic, you know, puzzle adventure game. Yeah, it's, it will be a bit different on the Saturn because this is a, a kind of full video one with, yeah. you know, modern effects and rendering where original, original Mist was a bit like a fancy slideshow. Yeah. Um, yeah, and... I don't know. When I hear mobile, I think, you know, I want a Nokia 3210 version of this on like an LCD <laughs> We've screen. We've got Mist that's, running on the Nokia 3210. Yeah, that's how guys. I'd enjoy Mist. But um, this does look impressive. Yeah, so... I, like I said, I played it a bit in VR yeah. and I didn't last very long in it. And I've got it on, I think, Xbox Game Pass. It was on there um, a while ago and I downloaded it on there. The original Mist to me, though, I mean, I remember when that first came out. Was it like 93, I think, Mist came out? Yeah. I remember seeing screenshots of it in magazines and just being like, couldn't believe the graphics. Yeah. It was one of the first first titles that sold CD-ROM massively. When I remember seeing CD-ROMs in shops, I'd go in and it would just be Mist, Mist, Mist and... Yeah, that that really like helped spur on the industry. But also, I've played it on the um, M1, and they're saying here, you know, it's uh, on the A12 chip devices, which is basically like a supercharged version of the M2 chip. Um, so there's a lot of like native ports as well, because Mist was really popular on the Mac. Um, mm. It was one of those kind of big Mac gaming titles as well. Yeah, and, in- and interestingly, Dan, you are right. It is a uh, ninety-three because it's actually this is the celebrate the thirty-year anniversary of uh, Mist. So it is actually the thirtieth anniversary. That's why they are re-releasing it on iOS. Um, and like you say, Ravi, they are saying it's going to be an enhanced version with it running on the the next generation M2 chip. So uh, hopefully, it'll look really, really nice. 
Because I remember getting missed on, um, I did get it on the Amiga when it came out later on, and I've gone back and played the original PC version. I think it's on the 3DO as well, actually, but it's, um, it's a very, very difficult game. And I yeah, think it's yeah. not something that's aged very well for modern audiences. I think, you know, the original Mist when playing that, it is one of those you had to sit down literally with like a notepad by your side and make notes as you went through the game to progress and remember things. Um, whereas I don't think many modern players would do that from briefly playing the VR version, which again, looked absolutely gorgeous. All I've done so far is I've not wandered around for about half an hour in it. I think it um, had a lot more hints and help in the uh in yeah the it definitely does. Yeah, one, yeah it yeah. doesn't leave 100% you so, so confused on the island you know well that's the thing with mist it doesn't really give you any context you know you just kind of dropped into this mystery world and then you kind of left to figure it out yourself so um i mean it's very intriguing and i think it's definitely got kind of an otherworldly feel to it i've always loved the atmosphere of mist and even in the original games like i said you know the stunning rendered graphics even though it was a a slideshow and it didn't move but you have beautiful sound effects in there as well and it's definitely got a really unique feel so i think this looks a really nice way to celebrate the 30th anniversary of it and interestingly they're releasing it for free oh, on really? iOS. oh cool yeah it's going to be a free game but if you want to kind of unlock there's um i think it's 14.99 they're saying to unlock um the other ages of mist so like you know the stuff like stone ship and mechanical and channel wood like the extra kind of modes in there. yeah it, it also looks good um that you know it, it supports like game pads touch screen controls keyboard and mouse as well so you can uh use it on your different devices like i can imagine it'd be quite nice on the ipad that might be quite a nice experience on there um and obviously having the big screen that's one thing about playing it on like an iphone or something i think the graphics in mist it warrants having a big display because it's so nice. Yeah, and being able to like it on a tiny little screen. touch things and move them around and play with them would be uh, quite nice on the iPad. Yeah, so that is available now on uh, iOS for free if you want to download that. So it should be available when the show comes out. And I put a link to the uh, article and the video in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, we need to talk about a vintage video card that is going for a ridiculous amount on eBay at the moment and a long-lost arcade game that's being discovered in just a sec. Before we do that, let's just pause for just a quick moment to give a big thank you to uh, this episode's sponsor, and that is our wonderful friends at Babbel. Now, did you guys ever learn languages at school? Yes, <laughs> French, and I'm still not very good at it. German, and I still barely know how to speak any of it, and I did it for five years. <laughs> that is one thing for people outside the UK. You might not realise this, but yeah, we do have to learn a language at school. But generally, nobody I know ever had success in learning languages at school. I did both French and German. Mm. And if I try to count to 10 in French, it generally changes to German when I get to about number six. <laughs> so they kind of merge together in my mind. One thing that definitely here in us Brits, you know, we, we've always been known around the world for sometimes being a bit lazy and not learning other languages. And maybe the way we get taught in school is, uh, you know, wasn't really a high point of our academic careers, to put it that way. But now there is something that you definitely need to check out, an addictive, fun, easy way to learn a new language. And that is thanks to our friends at Babbel. Now, maybe you're travelling abroad this year, um, going to be going away for the summer. Maybe you've got family abroad as well. Babbel teaches bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually use in the real world. So it makes learning a new language quick and easy because it focuses on natural conversation. And I think that's where we went wrong at school. I don't know if you guys are the same. I've got memories of like, you know, being there with a tape recorder, yep. wearing a headset and trying to learn how to ask for the bank or directions to the beach. Yep. Just words, just being like, just like yep. how to say the colour red, how to say fish, how to say swimming, things you would never actually say or ask for. You know, the things that you want to know is where's the nearest restaurant? You mm -hmm. know, not necessarily how do I do my taxes? When you're on holiday, I, in I can <laughs> I can say uh, a la a la piscine, I think, which is go to the swimming pool. <laughs> that was one that I always remember. Handy when you need an emergency swim in Paris, Ravi. Yeah, but Babbel gives you 50 minute language lessons that are designed to be the most efficient and effective way to learn a new language. Created by over 150 language experts. So that means real people. You'll learn how to have real world conversations and things you're going to use, not those meaningless phrases that we all used in school. And the interactive lessons aren't robots talking, they're voiced by native speakers using modern conversation-based methods as well. So it's not gonna be like, you know, the, the textbooks you read at school or the, the audio tapes you listened to from the 1970s. You're gonna be speaking in no time confidently about real life topics 
in another language. And their methods have been scientifically proven to be effective as well. And you can pick from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. And what I think is really cool is Babbel has got speech recognition technology mm. that will help you improve your pronunciation and even your accent as well. Because that's one thing I always worry about, you know, trying to do like a French accent when you're talking in it, you know, is it going to say enough? But it'll actually give you advice and feedback on that as well. So there's loads of ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to their lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, even join their live classes with a language teacher as well. So start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. And of course, you know, we always get you some incredible offers on this show. They're giving Retro Hour listeners three months completely free with a purchase of a three-month subscription. So all you have to do is use our promo code right now. Head to this website, babbel.com slash podcast23. That is B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash podcast23. Use the promo code retro and you will get an extra three months completely for free. Thanks to our friends at Babbel, language learning that works. And of course, I'll put that in our show notes as well. Now let's talk about this. Um, a long-lost arcade game that's been found. Now, this is something that's been rumoured and kind of talked about for many years now. But now, this is a game that was released in Japan in a limited run back in 1999. There was a collaboration between Namco and Sony. Are you a big fan of Um Jammy Lammy, Ravi? <laughs> um, to, to, to be honest, I've played it a couple of times, but it's one that I've not jumped into. I, I kind of stuck with Prapper the Rapper. And yeah. then uh, I saw that there was like Space Channel... Um, later on and then there was um Jamalami as well um yeah that was on ps1 wasn't it yeah so like you say it was it was the kind of like spin-off sequel to papa the rapper um but this arcade machine is um Jamalama now um like dan says it came out in 1999 in a limited release in japan and it's been thought to be a lost arcade machine now, for those who don't know, it's essentially a rhythm game, isn't it? On the mm. PlayStation, it's it's you know it's raps, it's music and stuff like that, and you you play along to it on the controller. Um, and in the first game, Papa the Rapper, you rapped. In the second game, on Jamalama, you played the guitar. So this arcade machine, it looks very similar to Guitar Hero to me. And you have like buttons on the controller, and you press them, you know, as the buttons come up on the screen to the rhythm. And then it has a very distinct graphical style, like a very um, shell shaded like cartoon 2d style like they look like cardboard cutouts but i think it really suits the style um yeah know, it was everything it was kind of from the same franchise so you had a uh, messiah matsura who did the uh original music with prapper the rapper and then yeah also the the art as well um rodney greenblatt and then that kind of went on to uh, you know, the next games and also yeah. Space Channel later on. But it was all kind of part of that series, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I had absolutely no idea there was an arcade game of it. Um, but like like, like we say, it was um, limited to Japan. But what's happened is it, it's been found in a private collection by somebody in Japan. So somebody posted a Reddit link about it, kind of saying, look, there's this game like Um Jamalama, the arcade machine. And somebody's come forward and said, I have this arcade machine in my private collection um, and they've actually been happy to dump the ROM online to ensure that it's preserved for future generations. So they're actually in the moment, you know, getting the ROM and they're going to dump it online so people can play it and have, you know, and check it out and stuff like that. And I think that's really fantastic because of there's so many of these obscure kind of like, you know, cult classic games, you then find out have like a, a weird offshoot arcade or a different version of it. Like there's the Street Fighter 2 cabinet where I think there's one left in the world where it's the, you know, the whack-a-mole, but they're all little M. Bisons and you have to mm. hit them and Street Fighter 2 plays out on, on the screen. Like there's only one of that left in the world, apparently, you know, and I don't think the ROM for that's been dumped or anything like that. I mean, that you'd struggle with that one because if it's a whack-a-mole game. But with this one, you know, it is ultimately the rhythm game and you can play it with the controller, I guess. So it's really cool to see that happening. And, you know, hopefully a few more people will come out and say, look, we've spotted these ones in, in Japan and stuff like that. It's, it's kind of like the uh, Guitar Hero one. I remember there was the Guitar yeah. Hero arcade units as well. Yeah, uh, yeah there it was. Looks a, it looks a lot more fun, this does, and a, a, lot, <laughs> a, lot, a lot cooler. It's um, definitely got that kind of like hippie cool vibe to it. I I, I do really love it. Um, so yeah, just I think it blows my mind when these things, you know, especially with like the video game industry being as big as it is now, that these things get lost, you know, over the decades. It's interesting as well, because um, from reading the thread on Reddit, it appears that the guy 
who's found this in his collection, was based in the UK. Oh, wow, okay. So it's interesting <laughs> how the games got over here. And uh, Why is it such a rare game, do we know? Did the like just not make many of them? I don't I don't know, to be perfectly honest, because, you know, I don't... <sighs> Papa the Rapper and Norm Jammy Lammy, I remember, you know, a lot of kids played them at school, and a lot of my friends go like, you know, they still sing it, like, you know, the Onion Man song at the start of um, Papa the Rapper, and, you know, me and my brother still do that. Jammy Lemmy because we had it on PlayStation and that was like how the game intro. So I to me it it doesn't feel like it's an obscure rare game. It feels like it was quite a big game, but you know, maybe it was just that the the arcade cabinet was just really like rare. You know, they just Yeah, didn't maybe they just them. didn't roll it out like, you yeah. know, uh maybe only a few of them came out and then this collector managed to get hold of it and there wasn't like a, a huge rollout of them. Well, I was thinking in, in 1999, I mean, you know, over here arcades were kind of fading away by that point so there could be a reason yeah. why there's not many of them kind of in europe and the uk i guess yeah i'd probably agree with that and then the guy who has it in his collection perhaps he's a big you know jamalama fan um and he needed to get a hold of it or maybe he just he's a big arcade collector and maybe has a warehouse full of arcade machines you just don't know mm. um but it's interesting and now there is some footage there's some short videos of people you know loading it up and, and playing it would have been posted on the reddit post on the reddit feed which is really cool and like you said, I mean, looking at it as well, in terms of control scheme, it doesn't look like there's anything kind of custom on there that you couldn't emulate. It looks pretty simplistic in terms of gameplay. I mean, there's not like any uh, controls that you're not going to be able to emulate in MAME on there. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, hopefully that will be something that we can uh, emulate quite easily. So um, I always love seeing like lost arcade games and lost anything just kind of get found. And particularly when the, the people that own them are willing to share it with the rest of the community because there's nothing worse than when you hear about, you know, a once in a lifetime find on some thrift market in California and the guy's like, no, no, it's mine. I'm not sharing it with anyone. It dies with me. Yeah. You know, it just never feels fair, does it? No, exactly. And that, and that's why I was saying, I think it's great that they are going to dump it. And like you say, you will get these skeptics, but I think, I think we'll have it in no time. Yeah. So uh, if you want to see the video footage of that so far, um, it's up on Twitter. I think it's put a few clips on YouTube as well, but I'll link up that Reddit thread and uh, an article as well in our show notes at the retrohour.com or on your podcast app. Now, graphics cards are something that tend to age pretty quickly, um, particularly in recent years with all the crypto miners um, rinsing them, you know, pretty quick until they die. Not the kind of thing that generally sells for much money, particularly a graphics card that is like, what, 20, 25 years old now. However, there is one currently on eBay that is selling, um, at the time of recording this podcast, I think there is uh, four days left on it, and the current bid is fourteen thousand one hundred dollars, and, is that on- and that's because this is a very rare three D FX card. And is that on bid? That's not buy it now or anything like that. That is current bid, and there are sixty three wow. bids on eBay at the moment. Now there is still time. <laughs> if you've got a, I've got a feeling this is going to go even higher than that over the weekend. I mean, that's the thing with eBay. Generally, you get the big bids right at the end, in like the last hour or two. So I've got a feeling, you know, when this ends. Um, Monday at 3.38 a.m. UK time. So there might still be a chance to get in there and uh, put your bid in over the weekend if you want one of these in your collection. And the thing is, these are rare because there's only ever about a 1,000 of them made. Well, yeah, but also you say that graphics cards aren't expensive. Voodoo cards are. (laughs) Like, Voodoo are the most kind of sought after old school graphics card and it's because they're so good at doing a certain period of time of gaming you know i I, in the amiga scene we used to go for the voodoo free 3000 pci and which would work with certain drivers as well and you know each voodoo card has its own period of time where it can do certain amazing things now this one seems to be one of the later cards and um I think you know, it was the last ever one, I think. Yeah, and it's AGP. Um, it's it's pretty big. Um, you've got four huge fans on there as well. And um, it's interesting because this, this is all about the anti-aliasing effects as well. So it can do um, eight times FSAA. And, um, you know, like some of these features are, are, are really good at the time. And this was kind of before all of the uh, other cards came in and, like, you know, the, the whole scene kind of changed. But I guess this is looking like one of the peak best highest quality agp cards that you can get i could be wrong there because i'm not i'm not detailed on a 
AGP, but um, I, I, I know a lot of people talk about voodoo cards a lot with a, a lot of love for them. Well, I remember the original voodoo cards. I mean, I've never really been much of a, a PC gamer. Um, you know, I was an Amiga gamer really until 2001. I mean, I had a PC then. I think my first graphics card was a um, an NVIDIA GeForce 2 that I got in like 99, 2000. And even that was only to play, you know, um, like Curse of Monkey Island and that kind of thing. I, I was never really pushing the, the boundary too much with them. And then ever since then, I mean, I got back into gaming big style in like, you know, mid 2000s. And then I've been console all the way ever since then, really. Um, but yeah, in terms of the original voodoo cards, I do remember reading about them though. And originally the voodoo cards, they were just 3D accelerators, weren't they? So you'd actually need a 2D graphics yeah. card in your PC. And then you'd run a pass through cable into the voodoo card that handled all the 3D effects. And really, they were made for Quake. Yeah, and and um, for that original. hardware acceleration as well, which was something that I hadn't had before. You know, it always been software acceleration, and then you suddenly have this box when you've got the new card and select hardware acceleration, and it's like, oh my god, <laughs> this is totally changed stuff because you're taking the whole load off the uh, main machine. And uh, yeah, they they were definitely a changing point, and uh, I I think there's a lot of kind of like older games that really still struggle with emulation or just won't run as nicely without some of these classic cards. Well, this card that we're talking about here is um, the 3DFX Voodoo 5 6000. And um, this came very late in the game. I mean, 3DFX went bust in 2002 and then got acquired by NVIDIA, who bought all their rights and designs and everything after that. Um, but this was, I mean, really late in the game, um, you know, for 3DFX fans. This was a card that they uh, they made a prototype version of it, but it appears from looking at screenshots and stuff online, there was like a box and stuff made for it as well. So it kind of looks like it was ready to kind of be pushed out commercially. Um, but they only ever made around a 1,000 of these prototypes. Now, this is a 128 megabyte a graphics card, um, like you said, AGP, quite ahead of its time as well, featuring um, four processors on here as well. But apparently they reckon because of the high production cost and the, the power demands as well, um, that caused the the release of these to be delayed. And then 3DFX went bankrupt, meaning that um, there's not many of these out there on the market, essentially. So that's really why these cards are very hard to get. Although interestingly, I think we did cover this about a year ago, that there was a kind of fan remake of it like a reverse engineering ah, yeah. yeah there was and, and and i think it was like meant it was really popular and i think you might have been able to change like the modes on it as well and and uh, uh kind of emulate different cards yeah i mean I'll, I'll put a link to that if you want to get a little reminder on that i mean there's a guy basically the the, the graphics chips on there are still available so you'd um he didn't like a uh, rip apart one of these very rare cards or anything. Um, he just kind of recreated it from the plans. Um, and I think he made it a PCI card rather than an AGP. But you know, if you've you ever wanted one of these cards and you're not willing to pay the extortionate amount that it's currently going for on uh, eBay, then uh, that could be a good way to get hold of one. So I link up that as well. But, um, you know, there is, it's weird, isn't it? You know, these cards, I bet if you got one of these prototypes, like, you know, 20 years ago, they were probably giving them away. Or you could have bought one for like a tenner back in 2002. It's weird, yeah. No idea these things how, be how did these get out into the public? It's, it's, it's very odd. But it's just how rare stuff kind of increases so much in value. Yeah. Over time, it's interesting, isn't it? It's like, you know, these would have been worthless 20 years ago. And the fact that now... I mean, God, you could have bought a house for like, you know, £30,000. But the, amount of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the amount of trade shows and computer shows I've been to where you've just got a like plastic box... It's just like graphics card, five pound each or something. It's just full of it, old school cards. I'd love to pull one of these out of it. It makes me wonder how many of these are sat in people's old computers on a landfill on a landfill somewhere as well. Or how many of them went in a skip yeah. when people threw out their machine, yeah. which was uh, <laughs> that's probably why things become even more rare. But um that is available on eBay now. So if you want to put a bid in, uh, you've got till Monday morning at um, you know, just before three AM. So I'll link that up in our show notes as well. And there's one more story to quickly talk about before we get into this week's special guest. Um, you guys are a fan of roguelike games. I've struggled to get into them, uh, to be perfectly honest. But maybe this is the one to get into after playing a bit of Amiga last week. You know, now I'm an Amiga, now I'm an Amiga fan. <laughs> I don't even know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> they're basically like turn-based games. Yeah, they're, they're kind of like... I, I, 
I, I'm not a hundred percent sure myself, but I always hear like this rogue game. Oh, this like they're kind of like dungeon crawler, collector fun kind of games. Um, okay. I, I, I don't, I don't want to. You know, I, I don't play them, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Well, it was Rogue was originally a game that came out back in the early 80s. Uh, right. I've got a feeling it was just on like um, mainframes and mini computers, that kind of thing. Uh, called Rogue, and that was a dungeon crawler game. Right. But really, it's now a subgenre of RPGs, essentially role playing games. Right. Um, but the, I mean, they're the kind of you know, like a lot of role playing games, you've got that fantasy kind of thing going through in the narrative. Really, it's influenced from uh, tabletop role playing yeah. games. So th- that's the big thing about them, that generally turn-based games. Right. And the graphics are quite simplistic. I mean, the original Rogue, I think, was like an ASCII-based game. Okay. So just, you know, text characters. The only one I really got into was there was a, a Rogue version of Doom. Right. That LGR did a video on, probably about, got about 10 years yeah. ago now. Yeah, yeah. And I, I downloaded that. It's a free game, probably still available out there if you want to download it. And I, I ended up playing that loads. I got really into it. And it was a load of fun. So I'm quite a big fan of the genre. Um, definitely something I'd like to explore more. But now it looks like um, there is a really nice new roguelike game called Rogue Craft on the Amiga. And this looks really nice graphically. Yeah, this, I think, at a glance, you know, it, it looks like a very early PS1 2D game or like a very, very graphically, you know, enhanced Super Nintendo game. But it's running on the Amiga now, I believe this is a port of a game called Rogue 64, which was a homebrew for the Commodore 64. Mm. But just visually, obviously, it's a dungeon crawler um, and it's turn based and you kind of move along. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like Diablo as well. And you move around like on squares. And then obviously, you know, you go through the through the dungeon. And there's like a map in the corner to kind of show you where you are and everything like that. And it is a, like a collector fun, you know, and obviously battling monsters and stuff. And it has got tabletop vibes definitely like you know D kind of vibes to it but i think mm. graphically the things the thing is with me and the amiga is i always i always see it and i think that looks awful like you know these games and these homebrews come out like these versions of castlevania and you know you know and it, it just always looks like this is what the amiga could do it's just there's so much kind of like you know <laughs> politics behind it where games were getting rushed out and like made in like two weeks you know um you know street fighter ports where they got rushed out and stuff like that and then you see these games like you know roadcraft and they just look absolutely amazing this is what like it, it's very like this is what you could have had you know it's it's yeah. it's also kind of like you, you don't know the library that well so there are a few games like yeah. this that um kind of have this really nice art style and this kind of dark but it's kind of like you know, with the Amiga, you're probably going for like platformers and stuff yeah. like that, where where there were a few like um, of, of these kind of exploration or dungeony kind of vibes. Uh, but this one looks very impressive with the kind of, you know, procedural generation that they've got on there, as well as the kind of, um, you know, uh, the maze area. You've got dark out sections as well. Um, I quite like that, you know, where you have the fog that, you know, reveals certain parts of it. Yeah, I think Joe was right there as well in terms of um, you know th- I, there were some you know a lot of graphically stunning games on the Amiga back in the day, but I think just the fact that anyone could make games for the Amiga mm. and there was no real bar of quality, you know, no quality control. Whereas you know you want to make a game for the Super Nintendo, you had to submit that game to N- Nintendo for their approval. Um, you know, get the cartridges made. They had you know even for a while they had the. You know the Nintendo seal of approval, didn't they? They put yeah. on games. Yeah, but like um, this, this looks like something that's kind of like Dartmare or, or or something like that. You know, it's got a, a pretty similar si- style to a, a certain genre on Amiga. And there are some very impressive Amiga games coming out right now. I mean, I was watching um, Modern Vintage Gamers video that he made a couple of weeks ago about new Amiga games, and you know, Amiga builded one last year, didn't they? Um, talking about ten new Amiga games that you need to play, and that just feels like there's so much coming out on that platform now that it's a really, really, probably the best time to be an Amiga gamer I can remember in the last 20 years in terms of new releases. Yeah, yeah. That's coming out on the platform. So, um, yeah, this is a work in progress at the moment. Um, no official release date as yet, but if you want to check out that so far, a brilliant roadcraft game for the Amiga, we'll link that up. And all the rest of the stories, you'll find them at theretrohour.com. 
Now, we're going to be going deep inside the world of Shadowgate with this week's special guest, Dave Marsh. He's coming up in just a second. Before we chat to Dave, let's take a quick moment to give a big thank you to another very loyal supporter of the Retro Hour podcast, and that is our amazing friends at ExpressVPN. And whenever we talk about ExpressVPN, I mean, we talk about privacy and how important it is. Because, I mean, I've got friends who will open an incognito tab in Chrome and think that's it. They're completely secure, completely private. No one can see what they're doing. But that's not the case, is it? No. So uh, ExpressVPN actually reroutes your internet connection, which is great because it means your ISP can't see the sites you're visiting. And um, you may wonder why that could be bad. You know, in the USA, people can sell on your information uh, to ad companies, which is pretty bad. But, you know, ExpressVPN is so simple to use as well. I use it all the time. It's really fast. You can have it. So it auto connects straight away, runs in the background of your PC or on your Mac or any any of your devices and basically keeps you secure. Yeah, and they've got these really secure servers and your ISPs can't see what websites you're visiting. They can't track you. It keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. And I know you, you have it on like auto boot on your devices wherever you don't. I mean, you never go online with that ExpressVPN. Run seamlessly in the background. You've got, you know, got it on our phones, computers. Got it on a smart TV as well. So there's no excuse not to be using ExpressVPN. And actually they're rated the number one VPN by sites like Business Insider. So we'd like to give you an exclusive offer here as well to protect your online activity with three months extra free on a one-year package of ExpressVPN. So if you're thinking of giving it a try, we'll give you three months for free by using our link expressvpn.com slash retro, expressvpn.com slash retro. And thanks very much to our good friends at ExpressVPN for their continued support of our show. Just a quick reminder as well that um, a really good way to support this podcast, if you don't join us on Patreon or anything like that, is just to leave us a little review. That always really helps. I think the last review that we had on Apple Podcasts was in November last year. So it was about three months ago now. So literally, it'll take you a couple of seconds. Give a little five-star review on there. If you leave a few nice comments as well, that helps the algorithms, you know, get us in the podcast charts and get us in front of new people. That is a really simple way you can help us out. So leave us a little five-star review and a comment on your podcast app of choice if it allows it. That always really helps the show. And next, we're going to be going inside the world of Shadowgate with this week's special guest, the wonderful Dave Marsh, next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time for our favourite part of the show when we welcome on a special guest, a veteran of the industry to share their history, their stories, their time working in the industry and the projects that they're working on today. And today we are joined by the founder of Zojoy and they're behind classic games like Shadowgate. He worked with Icom Simulations back in the day. Let's welcome on Dave Marsh. Hey, Dave. Gentlemen, a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Now, uh, we're all big adventure game fans on this podcast, so we can't wait to uh, hear some memories of our classics like uh, right. Deja Vu and Shadowgate. But before we get into that, I mean, it's always nice to kind of find out where our guest journey began. I mean, do you remember what initially got you into video games and what was kind of your first ever experience? Yeah, you know, I lived uh, outside of Chicago. I think it was probably, not, it, it was in the late 70s that I started playing Dungeons and Dragons. And we weren't that far from Lake Geneva, right? Where Gary Gagak started D and D. And so, um, every now and then my mom or one of my friend's moms would drive us over there and we'd go to this little shop called the dungeon. And, uh, sometimes Gygax would be there, you know, and, uh, we would talk and, you know, all they had was the books and lead miniatures and, uh, you know, we would spend time doing that. And so I, I just spent a lot of time drawing and playing D and D and drawing and stuff. And my, uh, my folks bought me a computer. I don't even know what it was. It, it might have been something from Radio Shack. It may have been something that I, I seem to remember buying it out of some guy's trunk, to be honest. And it had a, an art program on it. And it was basically, um, you know, I could probably place um, a total of maybe 200 pixels on the screen and with a little joystick. And that's all I did day in and day out when I had time was uh, to draw monsters and spaceships and, and other things on this, you know, cassette loading, um, PC. And so that's kind of my first, um, 
my first memories is, is, is doing, um, you know, I, I kind of felt that that was my, that was my deal. That was my gig. You know, that was my future was pixel art at that time. Right. So that's, um, that's my earliest memory. Yeah. Um, was that a, a color machine or was it, um, you know, it was, black and white? it was color. It was, uh, yeah, there was probably eight colors is my guess. And, and the program was, was really archaic. You would, there were the eight colors would be at the bottom of the screen and you would bring the, you know, the joystick, the cursor down to the bottom and, and select a color and bring it up to the top and hit the button and place the color, but you couldn't place it twice. You had to go back down to the bottom again. So it was very, it was a lot of minutia, right? And so, uh, yeah, that was my, my first thing. And then we would, I would, um, every day uh, after school, I would go to the library and they would have a modem there, um, a PC with a modem and it was connected to the, to the local, um, uh, community college. And there was a, um, there was a program on there called kingdom and it was just basically a, uh, you know, a text mud and you would just say, go north, go south, go, go east, go, west, go west. And, and you'd encounter a monster and you would press one to fight and two to run. And, and I played that a half so, an hour a day for years. So you got your kind of foundation, uh, through dungeons and dragons and muds then, uh, uh, uh of kind of yeah. like, you know, adventure titles and you, you ended up getting an Apple too, and then programming on that I, as well. Yeah. So that was, um. I picked up an Apple II, and this was the, the first thing I had done for ICOM simulations. I had met programmer, and, um, and I had an Apple II, and they were doing ports of um, various games. And I, um, do you remember the game Wizards of War, the arcade game? Yeah, yeah. I ported that to the Apple II, and I, I may have done, it's, I think I may have done Joust as well. But that was the first thing because I, I was used to doing pixel art and I liked it. I didn't mind that minutia. So yeah, first thing was the Apple II. It's quite interesting you were you're doing arcade ports then. Because I mean, how I mean, you mentioned that adventure game that you're playing um, via the terminal, the, the dial-up terminal. Yeah, were you playing many adventure games on the the Apple II as well? Uh, only probably. Do you remember Venture? That's probably it. You know, I was playing. I was probably playing that game. But uh, but I ended up in I think my freshman year in high school. So this would be 70, maybe 78 or, or so. They had um, one of those card-based PCs where you would punch the cards. And uh, I created uh, my own uh, my own adventure game uh, set in outer space and on these cards. And you just, felt, just fed these cards into this thing. I don't remember really how it worked, but it was the only thing I had actually written because I'm not a programmer. I mean, that's not the way my brain works. But uh, yeah, that was the first, uh, that kind of got me hooked on on kind of that adventure uh, game thing. So, yeah. Well, you mentioned um, Icom Simulations there. I mean, how did you get involved with them? And what was kind of the background of that company? Yeah, so Icom at that point had just, um, the Mac had just come out, right? And they were working and finishing up Deja Vu and Nightmare Comes True, which is a fantastic game. And it was taking advantage of Windows, right? So you could drag the windows around, you could put objects in the inventory, you could drag them into the back into the world. It was really revolutionary. Um, you know, this was before any of the other adventure games had come out. And so it was really taking advantage of, of the max power, you know, but having windows. And I met, uh, I was doing, um, volunteer work at a church and, uh, one of the guys who was volunteer work, uh, was, was programming there. And, and, um, you know, I was talking to him about it and, and he was mentioning that they were working at a couple other, they were working on another game, which was the uninvited, um, and the art was being done by a fabulous artist named Mark Waterman. And I just said, you know, I, I'd love to get a chance to, to work on a fantasy game. And so they got me a, a Mac, you know, with an external hard drive, which was uh, not ex I'm sorry, an external floppy drive. So I didn't have to swap Mac paint in uh, every, other, every other second. But uh, yeah, they, they just, um, my friend Terry Schulenberg, he was the programmer. Uh, he got me the, the, the Mac and I worked on on that with my friend Carl Rulofs, uh, who was also the designer of Shadowgate, and in my mom's uh, my mom's house, my bedroom, my mom's house, and uh, worked on that for about a year before they um, they liked it enough and gave me gave me a job. Well, they also had their titles published by Mindscape. What was the Correct. kind of relationship with Mindscape like there? Yeah, Mindscape was um, was a publisher just down the road. You know, uh, I don't. I mean, I would go there. We would, you know, we would talk, but. Uh, ICOM was doing, 
mean, Akam was mostly doing all those ports before they started doing adventure games, um, all those ports for arcade games and such, the Apple II and making their money that way. And so, um, and then we were also, they were also doing some, some so other software like Tmon, which was the monitor, which was the, which was the de facto um, debugger for the Mac. Everybody, if you were programming on the Mac, you used this and stuff. But yeah, Mindscape was down the, the road and uh, there was a guy named Scott Burfield who was the, the main project managers over there. And, you know, we just, I don't know. I, I mean, I was just a kid. So, you know, <laughs> I was just happy to be making games. I have no idea if they were a good publisher or a lousy publisher, but anytime I would, you know, go over to Egghead, which was one of the big gaming, you know, software places, I'd find our games and I'd, sh I'd line them up on the front of the shelf. That must have been so, pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, for, you know, I don't know how old I was. So that was 85. So I was like 21 and I, you know, they were paying me nothing and I was just loving being able to go ahead and do art. And in fact, they asked me to finish up Mark, uh, for some reason, Mark didn't do finish up uninvited. So I ended up jumping in and finishing up the, the, you know, the black and white Mac version of uninvited before finishing Shadowgate. So. So, so were you developing on the Apple II? Because like the, the, the Mac came out and there was a big change. What, what were the differences like or, or did you go straight into developing on the Mac? Yeah, really on the Apple II, I was just, I was just using a, um, a custom program that they had given me to, to um, you know, push pixels around. So outside of that, I was right, you know, on the black and white, you know, Mac, you know, using McPaint and that's all I was using. And learning about compression, because everything was about getting the game on a floppy, right? And so McPaint, of course, had all these patterns that was, you know, the brush patterns were what you, you know, used. So when I made dungeon walls or whatever else, I made as many patterns as I could because patterns would compress and, uh, and you know, not like patterns wouldn't. So it was a constant battle between trying to make the best art and, you know, use the patterns that of the, uh, of the, the brushes that uh, like paint would create. Well, I know on the Apple II there was um, the Apple desktop, also known as a mouse desk, which was a, a graphical user interface for it. Were you using that then, or when you got to the Mac, was that kind of a big jump learning a, a graphical user interface over a, a text command um, prompt? I don't, yeah, and I really don't. You know, it's so many years ago. I really don't remember exactly what I was using at that time. But um, the jump to the Mac was fairly easy. I had just there, the tools were so simplistic on for McPaint, and then you know going from there to I think the next one was like, um, was a studio one, right? Was the next program. And then there was studio eight. And, and then, you know, after a while, you know, we weren't making games on the Mac anymore. And I was working with, what was the Amiga program? Um, Deluxe, Deluxe Paint. Deluxe Paint. Deluxe, yeah. Yeah. Deluxe Paint or Degas on the Atari ST. They were pretty much all the same. Well, obviously from Icom, I mean, the, the Mac Adventure series was um, legendary, you know, a series of four games originally for the Mac, um, ported to many different systems. I read that they'd uh, since sold over 2 million units combined. So what was kind of the story with the, the Mac Adventure series then? And was that always planned to be like a series of games? Yeah, you know, it was it was actually interesting that I, I look back on it now. If you take somebody like what Richard Garriott did with, you know, with Ultima and stuff, he he you know, he created one game, very popular game. And then he, you know, he made, uh, you know, many sequels of it and stuff. And, and Icom really didn't work that way. Um, our CEO, his name was Todd Zipnick and he kind of, he kind of just wanted to do different things and which was fine and everything, but, uh, they we started with deja vu and it was, it was, it was really successful. And, um, then, you know, I came in, you know, halfway through the uninvited and finished that up. And then we did Shadowgate and put that, you know, got that out. And then Deja Vu 2 was, um, was done by an artist, uh, Julia Ulano. Uh, she was in, I think, San Francisco. And so, um, and I just kind of oversee, you know, a little bit of the, of the story and, and, and that kind of thing. But um, it was not, there was never really a, uh, a big plan. Hey, let's just continue to, to do one of these other things beyond Shadowgate. In fact, that all the art, I had, Carl and I had finished all the art for Beyond Shadowgate and it was halfway programmed before um, the company decided to stop making those games. At the same time, there were, there were, there were probably three or four other McVentures that were in some state of development. There was Todd Heth friends in Hawaii that wanted to make a game. So he flew me out there once, which was, was great fun. And it was a game called Helios and it was about a, a meteor that was going to hit the earth and you needed to assemble parts of a rocket. It was, it was awful. 
And so that, that kind of, that kind of went on the, you know, there was a game called gossip, which was, um, also going to use Julie as the artist. And it was, you were a gossip columnist in San Francisco and that wasn't any better. And then I, I know Carl and I did the complete design spec for a game called the awakening, which was a werewolf, uh, in 19th century London, which was a lot of fun. But by that time, Todd had moved on and wanted to do things like the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective FMV games. We had gotten into, of course, Chemco had come in and we had, we had, uh, worked with them to port the McVentures over to the NES, which was great. Um, but then, you know, we started working on with NEC for their turbo graphics machine. So it was just kind of like going after chasing the dollar at that point. And, and then we were also working on, um, you know, games for Sunsoft, which were uh, all the Looney Tunes titles, um, Roadrunner and Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny and, and those kind of things. So. The company was just kind of trying to figure out where, where to find its feet and eventually got bought by Viacom. So well, what were your kind of inspirations then for Shadowgate and the game's design? Yeah, it was, it was really just D and D right. Uh, and it's not, I'd love to say that it's a, <laughs> it's a great design and adventure, but I, I, I don't think it is. I mean, it's pretty, you know, we had kind of, when we talked about it, they said, let's just, let's just do a standard dungeon type adventure, you know? find the bad guy, kill him, that, that, you know, bad wizard, whatever. And, um, and then from there, we'll go ahead and keep expanding that, that Shadowgate universe, which never really happened. Although we did put Beyond Shadowgate out on the TurboGrafx-16, but it was a side scroller. But, um, so really it was just, um, playing D and D and Carl and I would sit around and say, what would be a cool room? And one of the things that we decided, we played a lot of dungeon crawl games like Dungeon Master and, and, um, I don't remember a number of games that basically had you in a maze and you just fought monsters. They were RPGs. And so we decided with our game that every room was going to be different. So when you walked in, you said, oh, this is different looking. It didn't matter if it was a lava room right next to an ice room or whatever it was. Um, so that was kind of our big, our big thing was the fact that you never knew what you were going to encounter in the next room. So, but, uh, mm. but yeah, you know, cut our teeth on, on that one with promises of future adventures that never really panned out until I, until I started the company again in 2012. You know, adventure games, I imagine, are much more complex to program than, you know, the, the simple arcade ports you were doing before. I mean, what kind of challenges do you remember um, when, you know, planning an adventure game? Do you have to kind of map out all the rooms and everything in advance? How does that kind of work? Yeah, you know, it really was. And, and the biggest thing was getting it to fit on a floppy. So everything was about, you know, we, you know, Shadowgate, we probably ended up cutting you know, I, I think there's like, I don't know, 40 some rooms in that game or whatever. We ended up cutting 10 at least or 12 and stuff that just wouldn't fit. And, you know, it was, everything was just, you know, Hey, do we, do we, do we, you know, where you had other companies putting games out on multiple floppies, we just kept saying, okay, how can we get this to fit? So it was really just designing, um, you know, laying it out, laying out all the rooms, deciding what the puzzles were going to be. Uh, and then, um, and then giving ourselves these you know, these parameters of, you know, this has to be so many, you know, so many bytes so that, you know, it's going to fit on a floppy. And, and so even in those early games, you'll see that compared to other companies, there were, there was compared to, while well, the NES game was the first, first one to actually have music for our games, like Shadowgate and Unified Deja Vu, Deja Vu 2. I mean, they were really, um, the first time that music was in, but, and the big reason was that there was just no room you know, we put some sound effects in that we, we found or made ourselves or whatever, but that was the biggest, uh, that was the biggest hurdle. Sure. Yeah. Sound effects on that, um, that, that simple Mac speaker, the Mac didn't have the best audio, did it? Of, <laughs> that all the right. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't think that's, I think Apple's come a long way. Well, how did you take advantage of the, the Mac's graphical user interface? Cause a lot of the previous adventure games that I was aware of were basically just type in games. Yeah. So those were just, uh, you know, those were just, um, you know, your multi-user dungeon games or your adventure games, which is, you know, Zork, right? Which is fab fabulous yeah. game. But the, uh, kudos to the guys, you know, before I got there who came in and said, not only does the, the Mac have, have the ability to have windows that you can open and close and, and shrink and, you know, move objects between, but we're going to make a game that works with that. And, um, Deja Vu is just a, a great example of how that works, gathering evidence, putting it in there. You know, making sure that, you know, like if you go to the police and, and you have the evidence that you need to go ahead and, and show that you're not the killer, but you have a 
something in there that, that could be a little, you know, sketchy, um, your evidence, you know, I mean, it just, it windows looked and said, Hey, what's in that folder, you know, that you have open on your, you know, on the desktop. Right. But, uh, so just taking advantage of, of, of the, of the windows, you know, interface and all that bit and, and the command system was, I, it was really revolutionary at the time. There was really nothing else like it. And that's what we heard when Chemco came to us and said, Hey, we want to port your games to the, to the NES. We just kind of laughed because like, there's just no way it's going to work. And, and it worked really great. And, you know, especially when you had games, you know, almost every game that was out at that time uh, on the NES were all side scrollers. And you had this game that was this first person adventure. And we really were the, the first first person adventures out there. So it, um, it was, uh, it was pretty nifty. Well, it's, it was also a pretty brutal game, like, uh, you know, a simple, uh, a simple mistake could kind of cost you a life in yes. in that title. Um, was like this sense of danger or something, uh, an idea of, you know, a threat, something that you wanted to go big on? I think most of it is uh, something like Shadowgate is definitely, you know, was known for its deaths. We had a lot of deaths. You died a lot of ways. And, and I don't think, and even when we redid it in 2012, um, without the restrictions of a floppy, obviously, or a cartridge, um, we looked at it and we just said, you know, there's so many puzzles here that are so random and so obtuse. Let's let's toss those out the door. Maybe we can keep the same rooms so people recognize those rooms, but we go ahead and change the puzzles that are to be more intuitive, right? And so where something like Deja Vu is very intuitive, um, it makes perfect sense. It's a good murder mystery. And, um, you know, and and I think that those puzzles are the, and that's my favorite game. Uh, Deja Vu 2 is excellent as well. But uninvited and, and Shadowgate were a little more ob- uh, uh, obtuse, and you know that that just goes back to just us being dungeon Dare dragons guys who were just making interesting rooms and stuff, and we didn't really we really didn't know, right? And so um, you know our goal as we got older, even Carl and I, when we work on like we're working on the second you know, this our second VR title, and we're just we just go we're always saying to ourselves is this is this make sense is this obtuse is this too difficult is this too easy is that constant you know making adventure games you don't have to it's like compared to an rpg an rpg there's so much balance that you have to deal with right just balancing out the characters and balancing out the monsters and everything well that's tough that's that's tough work for adventure games it's just balancing out is this that trying to find that fine line between this is driving, this puzzle is driving me crazy and, oh, I solved it. And okay, I feel good about that, you know? So it's, um, it's definitely Shadowgate uh, had its, its, its share of, and Uninvited had its share of, you know, obtuse things that, that I think, um, were just showed a lack of, of maturity on our part of designers. I was going to say, I think I've heard it from a lot of other people that, you know, especially kind of early in their career, you know, that you're that kind of in the zone and you're playing the game that much that you kind of get used to it and it feels very easy. So sometimes that's yeah. kind of, you overcompensate by making the game more difficult than it should be. Yeah. And, uh, and the other thing is that, um, today, you know, today, if, if, I've, if I'm making like a VR title, for example, I can look at other VR titles and I can see what people did right, did wrong, you know, how to go on that. I, I once went to a seminar, they talked about innovation. They said that radical innovation is rarely profitable, but it's incremental innovation that is very profitable. So when you get MySpace out there, it might not be profitable, but Facebook comes in and says, you know, what is it that they did right or they did wrong and how do we improve on that? And so there was nothing really out there for us, for me to look at, right? At that time. I mean, if I wanted to the games that I was playing on the side were things like Dark Castle, and that's that's not you know an adventure game, you know, or and so um, it's really tough because there was I we didn't know better, and I I didn't have contemporaries at that time, and they were coming up, and they were doing I mean Sierra the stuff that Sierra Online do was doing was incredible, but but by that time we were out of the the adventure game industry as far as Icom goes. I know Icom were very early to the game with CD-ROM titles as well. Yeah. In uh, 91, 92, I know Sherlock Holmes and um, Dracula Unleashed being yeah. prime examples of that. And, uh, you know, I think they came out in the CDI, the Philips. Uh, the, yeah, the they did CD Philips CDI. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the uh, yeah. FM towns in Japan. Yeah, all of those uh, systems that are long forgotten by most people now. Um, but they had, a, you know, full motion video in there as well. So, you know, thinking about, you know, FMV and CD-ROM, how are ICOM taking advantage of this new technology? Because it seemed like you, you know, very ahead of the game there. Yeah, it really was. And uh, I remember when... 
when Todd decided that Todd Zibnick, our CEO at the time, um, passed away many years ago, he would say, um, let's just, I, I like this new technology. I like this new thing. Let's do, let's do these CD-ROM things. And so the company um, was kind of split at that point of the teams. One team was just working on video technology. And, you know, back in that day, you know, day, the, the best you could get to run on that was, you know, the, it was like 100 pixels by 200 pixels or something, right? That, that video screen. And we would just sit there and, you know, they, they, they hired a, a crew in Minneapolis and they, um, hired local, um, actors from there. And, you know, again, the entire crew and makeup and costumes and sets, and it was all built and. And the director, and then we had a, our own director, Ken Tarola, who, who directed things on our, produced things on our end. And, um, but the thing was that in those, those Sherlock games, I'm still working on those Sherlock games, funny enough. Um, you know, I got, I have all the source, all the source on, on Laserdisc and it's all, you know, it's just a matter of getting it out on Steam, but the first three games are out and we're working on the la- rest. But, um, what's interesting about those is the fact of, uh, movement. Uh, you cannot have, it was, again, is a compression thing, you know, as long as the actor, if you watch those, those things, Sherlock and Watson moved very slowly or didn't move at all or whatever, um, because, um, changing pixels, um, in, in that video, um, made those, those two, you know, those files huge. Again, it was getting it to fit on a, on a CD-ROM, but, uh, those, those are really fun. Um, at least the Sherlock games. And I, I was the producer on the Dracula Unleashed game, which, uh, it was kind of campy. I think one guy said that the actors went to the Dick Van Dyke school of British accents, which I thought was really <laughs> accurate, right? Cockney accents. So I, I do have fond memories of, of shooting a lot of that stuff and everything, but, uh, but yeah, that they, they it, it was really, I mean, it was no night trap, but you know, it was really a fun, uh, a fun time. Was Dracula Unleashed like really meant to be kind of that B movie style? So I know that was very kind of back in vogue again in the early nineties. Yeah, so it was. It, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, just we didn't have the budget, right, to make a to make it truly, truly, um, you know, the best shot video or the best acted video. I mean, they, they, I think our script was a bit stilted. You know, we hired a, a couple of folks that were working on um, Vampire the Masquerade, um, and, and then our own, we had a, we had a designer named Tony Sherman and Tony did the design. The design was excellent. The design in the puzzles and, and we took, we took Sherlock, which was, you know, which is a points based system, right? I'm going to, I'm going to go to this location. I'm going to send the Baker street irregulars there and I'm going to figure out how many, you know, the fewest number of places that I have to go to gather my clues and then bring it before the magistrate. Um, here it was. Um, I need to survive um, a total of four days and um, I have to visit certain places and certain times or else I'm, I'm going to die. And it was a great design, but um, a bit campy, sure. In 1993, ICOM was acquired by Viacom. Um, right. What was the transition like between the companies and uh, what was the change like? It was pretty brutal. I mean, it, it was not, it wasn't anything that, um, you know, they had come in and they weren't really interested in in um the sherlock stuff and the dracula stuff obviously we you know we were finishing up the contracts that we had with nec and um they just said you know hey we're gonna make games you know based on on either nickelodeon mtv or paramount properties and um and it was interesting because mtv mtv was very cool about it mtv would come in and they would say look this is what we have we have beavis and butthead right and we have uh, a number, a number of other things, and but we don't know anything about making um, video games. But we know MTV, and this is back when MTV was playing, you know, videos, right? And then Nickelodeon would come in and say, "Look, you know, we have these other properties, Rocco's Modern Life, and and some other things, and and uh, we don't know anything about making video games, but we're going to tell you how to do it." And so it was, it was, uh, and then Paramount was just pretty, pretty hands off. You know, they were just like, hey, we've, we've got some stuff if you want to make it. And I wanted to make Star Trek, right? But they had already, they already had somebody working on that. But Star Trek, I'd actually worked on a prototype for a Star Trek V adventure game using the McVenture engine, um, but uh, they weren't interested. But uh, so it was, it was um, you know, it was tough. It was, not, uh, it was not the most fun years. Although some of the stuff we worked on, I mean, I worked on a number of Beavis and Butthead games, which is an absolute blast. But then I worked on a number of other things that, um, you know, we'll never speak of again. So, Was uh, Mike Judge yeah. involved? 
So in some of the games I worked on, we pulled audio from um, previous Beavis and Butthead stuff, especially when to trivia stuff, because we would just find Beavis and Butthead saying things like, uh, snakes are cool. Yeah, yeah snakes, snakes. <laughs> and we would be like, okay, <laughs> let's come up with um, some sort of trivia answer that uses that particular bit. And um, those were fun. And then uh, Mike did the, the stuff for um, the big Beavis and Butthead adventure that, that uh, the studio put out, which did really well. Um, but virtual stupidity was it? Yeah, and it was just yeah. it was a good adventure game, and it was it was fun. But uh, we just never really got the support from from Viacom, and Viacom. And that was the day when the big media companies were coming in and saying, "Hey, let's let's buy, let's get in the video game industry because this is cool and fun, and we've got all these properties." And in reality, MTV had really one good property, and I enjoyed working on like the Rocco's Modern Life game. That was a fun side scroller for Super Nintendo, but. You know, most of the time it it was it was um, it was not enjoyable. Well, that was a really big change for the company, I imagine, going from making your own adventure games to these kind of you know very heavily consoleized games like Roadrunner, Daffy Duck, and you know for the Super Nintendo. That seems like a bit of a, a gear change there, if you know to put it mildly. Ask any game developer about working with a licensor, and they will pull their hair out. Right? It's always a a, a tough thing, and. Sunsoft had picked up the rights from Warner Brothers for, for the Looney Tunes characters. And uh, for some reason, they thought that we could make side scrollers. And so we had a, this really great team, um, small team. Um, and, and, and basically Sunsoft said, came and said, can you do something that is as fun and as fast as Sonic the Hedgehog? And I was like, you know, I was the lead designer at that time. And I said, well, you know, I, I came up with this idea, Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally. And and what we'll do is we'll pull stuff from the cartoons and the goal is to get to the finish line with, with Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote will come in and do his zany acne bits, right? We had a couple artists, um, Brian Barber Durerty did the, the backgrounds and Jeff Troutman did the, the animations and they were just fantastic. They just looked great. But we had such a small, such a small team. And, and at that point, there was no email, right? And so everything went through with fax. And so I would send the design document off and... In one of the cartoons, Wiley Coyote opens up a box and written on the box says bat dash man costume. And he puts it on, it's green leotards with wings. Okay. And so I wrote, so one of the things was Wiley Coyote was going to come in dropping bombs in this Batman costume, but it's not Batman, right? It's this mm. green costume. So I send the design document off and, you know, next day I get a fax back from Warner Brothers said, everything looks fine, except you can't use Batman. Even though we have the rights to Batman, we can't use Batman or Robin or anyone else like that. And I send off a fax back and I say, not using Batman, not interested in Batman. It's from your cartoon, the cartoon that you've produced. He's in greed leotards, thing says Batman. And then the next day I get a, a fax back that says, Sorry, we're not allowed to use uh, the Batman uh, license, uh, blah, 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 blah. So finally, I mean, uh, you know, just wised up, wrote, you know, redid the design document that said, while Kelly flies around in green leotards, approved. So there'd be things like that where um, y you never knew who was on their end doing, checking out their licenses and stuff. But that was a lot of fun. That game did really well. Um, and then we followed that up with Bugs Bunny's, um, Rabbit Rampage, which was a fighting game, and then um, Duck Dodgers in the 21st century, which is, you know, Daffy Duck as Dodgers. And so, you know, they were fine. But then an SNES went on its way and, and off we went into other stuff. Well, you mentioned then um, Rocco's Modern Life. And, you know, to this day, that show has still got a cult following. Yeah. What memories have you got of working on that? Yeah. So when, when we talked about Rocco, and I loved that game, uh, that, that, that show. And I was a big cartoon fan just in general, right? Comics and cartoons and all that. Um, but um, I was trying to figure out, you know, when they were, the, the best part was that um, I, I really wanted, when I designed it, I was just like, you know, we need to put this thing on its head. They wanted a side scroller. And so I wanted to deliver that, but I thought it would be really fun if um, you were in basically invulnerable as Rocco and, um, and Spunky, you know, in the show was, was, a, was a really brain dead dog, right? And so we just said, let's just have Spunky walk through these dangerous levels. And your goal is to keep Spunky alive. And it was kind of unique and it was really fun, right? So, you know, if, if Spunky was walking towards, you know, lava or something, you know, and there was a platform before it, you had to jump on the other end and teeter-totter him out of there. And it was just a, a really, you know, fun thing about keeping him alive. So great, 
great time. Um, we had an artist, Elisa Kober, who was the artist on that. And, and, um, you know, it was just, it was just a lot of fun to, to, to work on that title. Not so much fun after that. And, and that was the kind of period that, uh, you know, Nickelodeon started getting really cool and like, you know, people right. were, were really kind of accepting it. And that was, that was really the start of it. So what, what was it like, um, working with the Nickelodeon people as well? Yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> They're so passionate about, about their, how they do things that, you know, at that point they weren't, um, you know, anything else, you know, that came out of Sesame street or anything else was not hip and, and whatever. And I just, um, you know, I, I was not, you know, at that point, you know, I, my son had just been born. I wasn't really, you know, that, that into, you know, what Nick was doing compared to, you know, stuff that I liked from MTV. So I just don't think I was the right fit. Well, Shadowgate, I mean, obviously another game that was, you know, had a really loyal following there. And obviously you've had, you know, several remakes over the years. And I know there was an N64 game that yeah. you weren't involved with. But you mentioned the um, Beyond Shadowgate, the original version that came out on the TurboGrafx-16. And that was a, like a side-scrolling platform game. What was kind of the story there then? And what was it a bit trouble trying to get a sequel to Shadowgate out? And yeah, yeah. why the change in direction? Well, you know, from what I remember, you know, NEC was right down the road, right? They, they had put out the TurboGrafx-16, which was a great game machine because you know what? It could play CDs, it could play your music. And they never really advertised that, which I thought was crazy because back in those days, a CD, you know, like if you bought a boombox, it was like a grand, right? And so it was really expensive. And so they had this great, great um machine with terrible games you know all they had was bonk and a few other games and so they came to us and said do you want to do some get you know some side scrollers and other things and we said sure and so um you know i don't remember who said it but they said hey why don't we why don't we do beyond Shadowgate and we'll we'll just make it a side scroller and have all the same crazy deaths and all that other stuff and i really wasn't involved at that point you know i i wouldn't say i was bitter about it i was just moved on to other stuff i was working on I was working on worse titles. So they would say, they would say, Hey, you know, we, we got this new, this new, uh, game idea called, um, you know, uh, uh, what was it called? Oh, it was called Camp California. And these are the, these rad bears and birds are the mascots of the beach boys. We want you to make side scrollers based on this. And, you know, I didn't know a lot of, you know, a lot of gamers that were interested in the beach boys, but that's what I was working on. Right. Or, and then we just had, you know, they just, NEC was just throwing stuff at the, against the wall, just saying, we just need more product. And, and unfortunately, you know, their, you know, software ends up driving, it's ended up driving all those, all those that hardware, right? And, and they tried to do something with Gary Gygax again, um, after he got kicked out of, or, you know, left TSR and stuff like that. And that was a disaster. And so it was, um, you know, at that point, you know, you know, working on projects that, um, that were going to pay the bills. And, you know, again, I don't really remember where beyond shadow Bay came at that point, but I saved the design documents, you know, of the, of the McVenture one and knowing that one day I'll get to them. Well, in 1998, Viacom shut down what was then Viacom new media right. and, um, sold off, you know, a lot of the IPs. Um, so what was kind of your move there then? Did you, um, kind of go to <laughs> infinite ventures? What, what was kind of the story there? Yeah. So, um, what happened when I was, I was there is that, um, I had, a friend who I had known since 1988, his name was Eugene Evans. And Eugene now is one of the VPs at Wizards of the Coast. And Eugene came to me and, and when Viacom shut down the New York office, Eugene came to me and said, hey, I know you're still there in Chicago. You're kind of running. At that point, I was running that studio at the end there. And he said, can you work with me and Viacom Legal? And I want to reacquire the rights. He, Eugene was going to require the rights to all the stuff I'd worked on. So all the McVentures, the Sherlock Holmes games, Dracula Unleashed is really what, what Eugene wanted. And I said, sure. So I worked with him to make sure that he was able to get that. And then he said, and once I get this, um, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to see about put, putting out some of the McVentures on the, the, the Game Boy Color and, 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 uh, and other things. And so basically I, um, had gone and moved to Virginia, which is where I'm at now to work on massively multiplayer games. And, um, and then Eugene said, do you, do you want to do some of these on the side? And I said, sure. And so I was working, you know, we were porting the games to Game Boy Color and into working again with Chemco and, um, and then also uh, working on porting them to, to things that Eugene said, Hey, maybe this will work. Maybe this won't. I mean, the, the games actually were on the pocket PC and on the palm and, 
and we ported Sherlock to DVD. You can play Sherlock on DVD player. And we got involved. We were working on Shadowgate Rising for the N64 before Chemco canceled it. And so we were always working on, we were working on a game called Lands of Shadowgate, which was a um, turn-based RPG game that would be played over um, your phone. And so we were doing a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of stuff there while I was um, working at a company called Kesmai, working on massively multiplayer games. So that's how we kind of kept Shadowgate and Deja Vu and Uninvited, especially, and, Sh and Sherlock alive. Sounds like you're doing some very innovative stuff there as well with DVD titles and games you could play over the phone and, yes, yeah, pushing the technology. Yeah, and we we're just trying to figure out what we were always, um, we were always just a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, again, we, we talked about innovation, right? We were in that, that radical innovation bit where it just wasn't profitable. And, and so later, a lot of these things that we, we had, uh, worked on, I think could have, could have been perhaps more profitable had they come a couple of years later, but it was a lot of fun and I enjoyed doing it on the time and yeah, at the time. So yeah, it's great. Well, going back 10 years now, you founded your own company, um, Zojoy yeah. in 2012. So what was the story there then? And then <laughs> why did you form your own company? So from. 2003 till 2012, I was um, uh, designing um, games for casinos. And so, um, which is what I, I still do now. Um, again, I went back into that industry, but I was doing that. And I left the company that, that had hired me that was working on that. And I was working for a, a small startup. And um, it was at this time that Kickstarter came out. And, um, the Kickstarter for broken sword came out. Do you remember that? Yes. And so we looked at that. I looked at that and I said, geez, I would love to go back and make some of, uh, of, of the games I had made in the past and without the limitations that I was under with cartridges and floppies. And so I, I called Eugene up and I said, um, you know, and, and Eugene was at that point, uh, the director at, he was a, an e, a director at EA. And, uh, he was working, um, at a company called mythic, which did dark age of Camelot and a few other games. And so I said, what are you doing with uh, Shadowgate? Not invited deja vu, deja vu to Sherlock. And, and he said, um, you know, nothing. And I said, well, I'd like to re I, I would like to reacquire those from you. And, um, I'm gonna, uh, I want to start my own company and I want to try to kickstart it. And so he said, yeah, that's great. So we worked out that deal and, um, I started with Sherlock because I was afraid of kickstarting Sherlock because I was afraid of, of going out there with, with Shadowgate, which was obviously my number one license and uh, the one I cared about the most. And so the Sherlock uh, Kickstarter was, was not good. And part of it was that I didn't know what I was doing. And, um, that's the thing about Kickstarters is you really have to, you really have to go in knowing what what you're doing and what you want, what you think the, the, the gamers and the audience, the pledgers want. And so I started Zojoy and, um, I mentioned to you guys offline that I, I, I just it, I found a name generation program. And for four hours, I wanted a, a, a five letter name that I could make a dot com that was available. And so I thought Zojoy looked cool. I thought I liked the OJO in the middle. I thought that was fun. I thought the Z was cool. I thought the Joy was fun because I wanted to make games that were fun and happy and whatever. And so um, I started that and I started calling people that I knew, uh, programmers that I, that I knew and, and artists and um, just said, you know, let's do, let's, let's try doing this and everybody will make royalty off of it. And, um, and that's kind of how it started. And so the, the Sherlock Kickstarter was not successful. And then we said, well, let's try it with Shadowgate. And that, um, that one, we spent a lot of more time on figuring it out, a lot more time on um, what would the rewards be? How do we target this audience? And, um, and so um, I didn't, I didn't want to make Beyond Shadowgate yet. I wanted to make, uh, I wanted to retell Shadowgate again. I wanted to get rid of the obtuse puzzles. I wanted to do all new art. I wanted a soundtrack. I wanted all of that. So I started, I started working my way through art station to find an artist. And I found a guy named Chris Cold in, 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 in Russia. He's fabulous. And his, his look and feel of it was very dark and very gritty and very speed painty, which I loved. 
And then um, I was sitting on the beach in Virginia Beach uh, one day, and I was looking at, on my phone and listening to YouTube, you know, watching YouTube videos. And I found this guy named Rich Douglas, um, who was a musician who had um, taken the Shadowgate theme from the NES and turned it into an orchestral theme. And it just blew my mind. And so I sent him a text right off the bat and said, would you like to work on this? And he, he did. And so just kind of went through and, you know, we put a, I think we, we tried to raise 125,000. I think ultimately we raised 140. We were piggybacking a bit with another Kickstarter. Uh, the guys had worked on the Leisure Suit Larry games and uh, we were sending people to them. They were sending people to us, both of us wanting to go ahead and, I mean, they, they had a much bigger goal, but, uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of got reacquired it, started a company, did a Kickstarter made enough to pay for art and audio and, and sending out posters and boxes and then just uh, lived off of ramen noodles while you know, <laughs> yeah. trying to finish it up. But it's great to see Shadowgate coming back and, uh, you know, a very faithful update of the original game as well for, for new audiences. And uh, I know there's been a big appetite for more Shadowgate and um, very soon we're going to be getting a proper kind of official sequel to the the old NES game, aren't we now, with um, Beyond Shadowgate, which is coming to Kickstarter this month. So um, give us the, the spiel then. Tell us a bit about this. Well, after finishing Shadowgate, I, I decided to work on kind of a, you know, kind of a love letter project for myself, um, kind of a Greek god um, game called Argonus and the Gods of Stone. And I worked on that with this this artist, Adam Mixner, who's, who's, who's fabulous, and um, a programmer named Thane Bowman. And and we had we had worked on this for for four and some years and put it out there um, on Steam uh, along with thirty other um, indie titles that launched that weekend. And um, the game didn't, although, although it's my favorite game I've ever worked on, it, it didn't do didn't do very well. I mean, we just had it was just beautiful, and uh, it was a really fun adventure game. And I pretty much decided I was done. And so I'm getting to your your thing about Beyond Shadowgate. Just give me a sec. Yeah. Yeah, and no uh, I figured I was pretty much done. Shadowgate continued to sell. The regular Shadowgate, the 2012 version, continued to sell. And I was looking at licensing um, Shadowgate and other things out. And people had talked to me over the years about buying my licenses and things and my properties. And But I was pretty much done because it was four years of, you know, it was uh, that didn't, you know, the game didn't work and uh, or didn't, you know, sell. And so... Um, Rich called me up and said, you should get into virtual reality. And I said, look, I have, I have, uh, you know, an HTC Vive headset and, uh, you know, it's fine. It's all right. And they said, no, you need to pick up a quest. So I picked up a quest and I said, this is it. I'm going to make VR games. And so we worked for, for nine months on a VR prototype of Shadowgate and it was really cool. And, and Oculus thought it was cool. And we put that game out and it's done, it's done pretty well. And, um, we were in the middle of work, starting to work on the next, the next one, which we're still working on, uh, which is um, Shadowgate VR. That's called Shadowgate VR in the Minds of Mythrock. We're working on Shadowgate VR, the sequel, um, the source of magic. So at this time, one of, uh, one of the designers that had helped me a bit um, on Argonus, his name is Chris Mosley. Chris came to me and said, hey, there are these guys in a, in that work for a company called Graph Metal. And they put out these homages, these adventure games, and they put them out for free um, on, um, was it itch.io? Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, the website, yeah. Yeah, they put it out there, and they even say they're an homage to the McVentures, and they're really great. And there's this guy, um, Jeff Kanan, who is fabulous, a pixel artist. We should see if they're interested in doing Beyond Shadowgate. You and Chris would say to me, you have that design doc, right? I'm like, yeah, it's four binders. It's, you know, it's like 16 inches tall total, right? If I'd stacked them up and he said, we should do that game and, and, and we'll just do, we'll just, let's just, let's do that. And I said, I don't know. So he said, I'll get, I'll, I'll find out all the information. I'll contact these guys. So he said, these are the guys, this is their Twitter account. Send them a Twitter. See, send them, sorry. Sound like an old man. It's like my mom. Send a Twitter. <laughs> but he's like, send, <laughs> send a tweet and see and see if they're interested. So I sent off a tweet and I just said, would you be interested in working on Beyond Shadowgate? And immediately they, they got back to me and Jeff's like, I, you know, I would love, I would love to work on that. And so we started talking about it and he started doing some, some designs even before we had a contract and Chris had gotten involved and and it was just stars aligning and it just, the stuff he was doing was beautiful. And it's, um, 
you know, it's, it's stunning pixel art. And so I said, well, you know, let's, let's do this. And they're like, well, we have, we have a musician that, that, that's going to do a guy named Ori Faulkner. He's going to do the, the chip tunes for it. And, um, and I was like, that's, that sound, that sounds great. So we worked out a contract. And if you've seen the, the, the video that I did, the, pr the pr presentation video, it's four times, these guys just keep going. It's four times the size of Shadowgate. It's got a section in it that basically has a haunted mansion in it because they loved Uninvited so much. It's got, yeah. you know, all these NPCs. It's got, you know, it's got a day night cycle. It's got all this stuff that, um, you know, we, we never had before. And it was, is really great. And so, oh, during all this time, uh, another designer that I've worked with, and I'm a guy named Chris Geiset. Chris ends up coming to me and saying, I want to make a Shadow Gate board game. And uh, I don't have a publisher and I want to make a board game. So uh, I want to make this Shadow Gate the Living Castle board game. We're going to use art from, from Shadow Gate 2012 game, 2014 game. And uh, then we're going, I I'm going to do the Kickstarter. And I said, that's fine. You know, go ahead. Because I love Chris. And so, uh, so Chris Geiset, he does this Kickstarter. It's not doing very well. But he is pounding the pavement and going to Gen Con, all these cons. He's showing the game. He's paid, spent all this money to have the board game made. And then this company, Trick or Treat Studio, comes in and says, we're going to publish that. So, in fact, I've got copies sitting right here. So that comes out at the same time. Chris, guys, it's a super Shadowgate fan. And he says, I would love to have a Beyond Shadowgate cartridge. And I said, one that actually works in, a, in, a, you know, in an NES. And he's like, no, 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 no. Just I want a cartridge and a box and a map. and I want all of that stuff. Just he, a collectible. Yes. He wants to collect yeah. because he's got this shrine, which is crazy, but I love him. And so I said, okay, well, the only way we're going to do that is if we do a Kickstarter, because I got to believe that, look, here's the thing. There's a, there's a Shadowgate um, Facebook page. Anytime I post on there about Shadowgate stuff, people are interested. They, they find the VR stuff interesting. They find the board game interesting, but all they really care about is NES Shadowgate. And they care about yeah. beyond Shadowgate. And so I said, well, there's probably a good number of people that would be really interested in a, a Kickstarter to, to get that kind of stuff, to get a cloth map, to get the box. And, and then Chris Mosley comes in and says, I found the original artist for the NES box. He wants to do work with us. And I went, okay. So oh, wow. we got him to do the art for, for the box. And then we, and then Chris guys, it's how about a bigger collector box that will hold that box and, a, and a map. And we could do these collector coins that I, wor I work with the guys at Goliath coins. We'll do those. And I'm like, yeah, all right, we could do that. And they're like, and if the game is successful, we'll port it to the switch. And so the Kickstarter ends up coming about because Kickstarters are tough to run. And you guys have run one and you know that it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so, um, I just said, well, you know, if we, if we have enough updates and we have enough cool swag and what are we going to be paying for? You know, what are, what are people pledging for? Were they pledging for the game? Okay. What do we need? Well, we still need to pay Ori to, for the audio. So that'll go to that. And we need to do these, the swag and stuff and the rest of the stuff will fund. So it's a, it's a very, I think we're going to be asking for $25,000, which is gets to the minimum of mm -hmm. audio plus the minimum number of units to create, you know, that manufacturers have to make, right? Because you yeah. can't just make 10 cartridges, right? You have to make like 300. So it's like, um, I said, yeah, let's do that for, for, for people that really love that. We'll be open, honest right off the bat. We're making this so that you can have really cool swag. You'll help us finish the game. You know, we'll, we'll have very few tiers so that you know exactly what you're getting into. And so, uh, so yeah, that, that, that launches on February 18th. Well, Dave, I, I was going to wish you luck with it, but I don't think you'll need it. You know, the, the Shadowgate community is so big and it feels like now is, you know, I don't think there's ever been a, a better time to be a Shadowgate fan with all the stuff that's happening right now. And obviously this game that, you know, people have been waiting almost 40 years for an official, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. sequel to the NES game. Exactly. So uh, Beyond Shadowgate, um, like you said, live on Kickstarter from February the 18th. Um, you can uh, notify uh, on launch on Kickstarter right now. So yeah, I'll yeah. put a link to the, the project page in our show notes so everyone can click through to it as well. You, yeah. Um, Dave, just I, I wish you all the best with it. And thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing some memories with us this week. It's been lovely to talk to you. Yeah, it has been lovely. And I do appreciate uh, you guys uh, having me and uh, love to talk about it. And, and thanks for letting me share some of those, those memories, the things I can remember. Mm -hmm.